All righty. With that said, you know that Lane's immune system is like ramped up right now. She's got inflammation going. So let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, so today we're going to be talking about the components and kind of an overview of the immune system. There's a couple branches of the immune system. One's called the innate immune system. And we'll talk about that component. We'll also talk about the second um, arm of your immune system, the adaptive immune response, including antibodies. We'll talk a little bit of the pathologies of the human body, things that can go wrong, and then how your body uh, responds to pathogens just real, 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 real quickly. So first, just looking at the components of your immune system. So your immune system is made up of immune system cells, and those immune system cells are classified as white blood cells, and there's different types of white blood cells. But these reside in your immune system, um, your lymphoid tissues, the tissue. So you have white blood cells in your tonsils, in your thymus, um, in your lymph nodes, which are all dispersed along your body, the, the vascular system of your body. You have lymph vessels, which drains the lymphatic fluid. When you have inflammation, you're building up lymph fluid, and that drains it back to the blood system. Your bone marrow, which is in the spaces of your bones that contains the stem cells that create these white blood cells. Your spleen is also a lymphatic organ. And then the whole lining of your body, that the part of your body that um, is exposed to the outside world. So your they're all lined with mucosa. So mucus secreting cells along with lining of that with these white blood cells. So of your respiratory tract and your reproductive tract, we call that malt, mucosa is associated lymphoid tissue. And then of your gastrointestinal tract, you have gut associated lymphoid tissue. So all along your digestive tract. So we're creating this barrier of between the outside world and the inside world, binding it with immune system cells. So with that said, if we can have a quick overview of your immune system, and this is just the nitty gritty of it. So we have several layers built into the human immune system. And the first one is just the barriers. So what are we being exposed to? We're being exposed to viruses. We're being exposed to bacteria. We're being exposed to toxins. We're being exposed to parasites. So those are all what I would cl classify as pathogens or foreign agents. And you need an intact physical your skin needs to be intact to create that barrier. So not only do you have your skin being intact, but you also have this mucus layer that traps any of those pathogens um, and then other secretions that help us to move those pathogens away from and out of our body. We also do mechanical flushing. So all lining our respiratory tract, we have cells that have cilia and cilia are just little cell appendages that allow that move and they kind of push any kind of trapped pathogen out of that mucus and bring it back up to the um, up to your oral cavity so you can swallow it. Uh, we also have chemicals, so um, enzymes on our surface of our skin, in our tears, um, the pH of our skin, um, and we also secrete antibodies to the surface of our skin. And all of those things create an environment that's not conducive for pathogens to get a, a, a toehold into our body. If those barriers fail, then the first part, the first arm of our immune system is what we call the innate immune response. And this innate re immune response is very rapid, and, but it is nonspecific. It just says something bad. I'm just gonna attack it the way I know how, not, not very specific. With, not with high specificity. It also has no memory. So your innate immune system involves those certain types of those white blood cells. And it also involves these chemicals that we call cytokines. If your innate immune system fails, or if it's not working sufficiently enough, then we call in the second arm of our immune response. And that's the adaptive immune response. This takes a little bit longer for it to get activated. But once it's activated, it's highly targeted, highly specific for the pathogen that has invaded your body and it has a memory. So um, for my students, I kind of say, the innate immune response is just your local police department. They just come out and do what they do. The adaptive immune response are the special forces. 
you know, you might say there's an arsonist or there's a sniper and they come out with specific training or they're the bomb. So the bomb squad comes out or, you know, they come out very specifically, but it takes a little bit longer for them to mobilize um, and get to the site. But basically what your immune system's job is, is to destroy or suppress the pathogen so that you don't get sick. So I wanna talk a little bit more about your innate immune response and then a little bit more about your adaptive immune response. So with your innate immune response, there are these white blood cells and they develop in your bone marrow, they're released from your bone marrow and then they circulate in your, in your blood and then they also migrate into um, the lymphoid tissue, those mucous membranes. And there's different types. So there's monocytes, there's neutrophils, eosinophils and basophils. They have different, they look different, they stain differently under a microscope but basically they have different jobs. The monocytes and the neutrophils, they are things that we call phagocytes. So their job is to ingest, eat. Phagocytized to phage is eating. They eat anything that's foreign. So they eat parasites, they eat bacteria, they eat um, viruses, they eat toxins, and then they digest them, they get rid of them. So they immobilize them and, and digest them. There's also eosinophils and basophils, and basically they secrete certain types of chemicals. So all of them secrete some chemicals, but these guys also, they secrete little chemical messengers and we call those chemical messengers cytokines. And these messengers have different jobs. And this is just the short list of the messengers. They, they trigger an alert. They tell the surrounding cells, hey, be careful. There's a pathogen on loose, protect yourself. Um, they, these chemicals might actually kill the invader. These chemicals might, um, these cytokines might call more troops into the area. They recruit um, more white blood cells into the area. And these chemicals cause inflammation. So inflammation is part of your innate immune response. Next slide, how come that's not moving to the next slide? Let me go down here, next slide. Oh no, it's frozen. There it is. So inflammation is actually a normal part of your repair process. And there's there's five cardinal signs of inflammation. Lane can show you her leg. <laughs> it shows all these. So um, there's pain associated with inflammation. There's heat to the area. There's redness and there's swelling. Um, then there's also loss of function. The redness and swelling um, just are bringing more blood flow into the damaged area. And with the more blood flow, um, you're getting the heat because blood is warm, but it's also doing its job. It's bringing more immune cells into the area that's damaged. It's also bringing repair molecules into the area, nutrients needed for repair. And then the pain part of it is because that swelling presses on nerves and that triggers and the cytokines also trigger a pain response. And that's a good thing because it immobilizes the damaged part. You don't want to do more damage by moving it too much. So it can create some loss of function along with it. So all of these are part of the normal um, immune response. Why we get concerned about inflammation is sometimes our immune system overreacts and it can cause collateral damage. There can be so much um, inflammation that it damages surrounding cells. So sometimes we do take anti-inflammatories to try to keep it restricted just to the site of injury. Um, an interesting thing, I, and it's not really related to your immune system, but I read a paper about pain and I wanted to share this with you, is that, um, you know, you all probably tell your clients, you need to work through the pain. Yes, this is a painful process. Um, we want you to work through that pain, but not to the point where you're doing more damage, but we do want you to try to move your joints, try to move the area. Um, and so they call that activity dependent muscle pain and you're often advised to um, try to move the muscle to work through the pain. And what they noticed is, and the reason they're saying that is because training actually increases testosterone levels. So anytime you do any exercise or training, you're going to have an increased, even for women, an increase in your testosterone levels, and that will increase your muscle mass. And not only does testosterone increase your muscle mass, but testosterone also increases these 
the number of receptors on surface of your nerve cells. They're called the opioid and cannabinoid receptors. These bind internal or endogenous opioid-like compounds that we already make and internal canna cannabinoid type compounds like the THC what's found in um, marijuana. And the, when they bind those, uh, the, when the, the opioids bind the receptors, it reduces the pain. So it's a, it's a nice thing. Exercise is doing two things that are good, increasing your muscle mass, but also reducing the pain. So helping you to build up that area, get repair, good repair processes. So this is just from, um, here's the, the journal that it was found in. Resistance training protects against muscle pain through activation of these androgen receptors in male and female mice. So that is your innate immune system. If the innate immune system can't keep the infection localized, if it starts to migrate out of that local area, then you call in the, the adaptive immune system, you call in the special forces. The adaptive immune system involves these cells called lymphocytes, and there's two broad categories. One of these are B lymphocytes and the others are T lymphocytes. Again, these are all made in your, they're white blood cells, they're made in your bone marrow, but they go through what we call a maturation process. They need to have special training. And so that maturation process is a special training process. So they're made in mature, B cells are made in mature in the bone marrow, T cells are made in the bone marrow. Then they go to your thymus, which sits just in your uh, sternum area above your heart. And that's where they get that final training, that maturation phase. And then from there, they're released and they circulate in your body. They circulate through your lymphoid organs and through your blood. But they're inactive, Lane. Yeah. Yeah. It, do these start to mobilize maturity when the first phase starts? You know what I mean? Would they be, if they take longer to, to, to kick in, would they be starting at the same time? Yeah, they're made all the time, but they're special forces. So um, we don't make a lot of them. So we say, oh, I'm going to have some of these be snipers and some of these, not snipers, some of these be, you know, specific for snipers. Some of them be specific for arsonists. Some of them be specific for suicide people. But we have a small population of them. Why they need to, why, why it's slow is because oh, I'm living in an area where there's a lot of arsonists. I better bring more people on board. So then it takes, that's where the slowness comes in. I need to build up those cells. I need to make more of those cells. Yeah. But they they move around in your body um, in an inactive form and you have to activate them. They have to be told to be turned on. We don't want, we don't want your immune system on when it shouldn't be. So that process of being told to be turned on is an activation step. And when the B cells, for example, are activated, they become, they turn into cells, plasma cells, and those are the ones that produce the antibodies. And then they lodge in your different lymph nodes. And you know this, you know, when you go to the doctor and you say, I don't feel good, they'll palpate. Um, you have a lot of lymph nodes along your collarbone in your jaw area. They'll palpate under your arms to see if they're inflamed, if they're swollen. If they're swollen, it means you have a lot of B cells, plasma cells in there producing a lot of antibodies. It just means you have an infection, a bloodborne infection. But also, and this is the second part of that, is you also retain a memory. You generate what are called B memory cells and they go to the site of infection and they remain there. And they are the ones that prevent further infection, these B memory cells. The T cells are also, you know, circulating in your body. There's different types of T cells. So these are interesting. There's ones that are called T helper cells and their job is to activate other immune cells. They activate the T cytotoxic cells. They activate the B cells. They also say to the macrophages from the innate system, they say, tell the innate system, hey, you guys got to step up. You're not doing your job. So they're activating, telling everybody to be on high alert. When the T cytotoxic cells are activated, they're destroying cell, your self cells that are virally infected. So they have a virus inside of them or cancer cells. So self cells that are cancerous, for example, or damaged. 
They also, when they're activated, produce T memory cells. So again, their T memory cells migrate to the site of infection. So they're ready to go for this prior next time around. And then we need to tamp our, our system down. So late in the immune response, you'll get a, a population of T suppressor cells that are increased. And they say, hey, stand down troops, we've got it under control. So it's important for us to have checks and balances on our immune system response. So this kind of goes to Lane's question is, what is this maturation of the lymphocytes? What does that mean? Maturation means that we they specialize. Certain populations of these cells specialize and they form clonal populations. So I have clone one, clone two, and clone three. And these could be either B cells or T cells. So I have, uh, let's say these are B cells. This is a clone one of B cells. They are specifically looking for things that are circles. So they have on their surface, these receptors, and these receptors are looking for things that are circles. And circles are bad guys, the bad guys. And we don't have circles in our body, but they're looking for circles because that means something foreign on the outside. This other population, these are the guys looking for squares. They're not looking for squares squares on us, they're looking for squares from something foreign. So we don't have squares in our body. And the clone three is these triangles. They're looking for triangles. So, um, you know, it's these clonal populations are released. They populate your lymphoid tissue. So for example, I have small populations, of clone one, two, and three, and they're maybe residing in my respiratory tract. And I get a uh, a viral infection that happens to be a virus that's a, that has a triangular shape, I'm going to activate specifically the third clone number three. Clone number one and clone number two, they're not doing anything, but clone three is going to be activated. So those are both your B and the T cells. Okay, so with that said, how do we get this activation? So activation is a multi-step process. Again, we wanna make sure that we don't activate something when we shouldn't. So how does this process happen? And the schematic's a little bit blurry, but the first thing is these are T helper cells over here in the schematic and next to it is a phagocyte. So the phagocyte has eaten something foreign. It's, it's eaten a bacterium, it's eaten a virus, it's eaten a parasite, it's eat, eaten a toxin. and it's, it's digesting it, getting rid of it, but there are some of those phagocytes that run to tell the T helper cells and say, look what we found. We found a triangle, a bad guy here. And the T helper cells, are you sure it is a triangle? Yep, it's a triangle. Okay, got it. So the T helper cell becomes activated. The T helper cell activates the B lymphocytes of the triangle clones. And then those B lymphocytes become plasma cells and they produce these things called antibodies that are looking for triangles. The B cells also produce memory cells. The T cells also produce memory cells. And then you're also activating other things within your immune system. So it's a, it's a multi-step process of activation of a very specific set. Again, this is the general police out there calling the special forces, the FBI saying we have an arsonist in the neighborhood. Okay, are you sure it's an arsonist? Yep, sure it's an arsonist. Okay, I'm gonna activate clone one because these guys are specialized for arson, people who light fires. Okay. So with that said, what are these antibodies and what do antibodies do? Antibodies are proteins and they have various functions in your body. Um, so three, two main broad categories. So antibodies bind to things that are foreign. Antigens are just foreign objects. So they bind specifically. They're looking for a specific shape. So in the case of the arsonist, they're looking for the specific triangle. They're ignoring squares, they're ignoring circles, they're looking just for triangles. And when they find the triangles, they bind them. It could be a virus, it could be a bacterium, it could be a toxin, and they bind. The antibodies are these things that look like Ys, and they're binding um, anything that's foreign that has the right shape. And when they do that, it causes these things to look bigger and more tasty. And so your phagocytes, the macrophages, the neutrophils, the monocytes, those, those phagocytes now can find them and see them. It's making them look more tasty. It's making them bigger, basically. 
The other thing that they can do is when the antibodies bind to something that's a cell, a bacterium in this case, for example, it causes the activation of these proteins, they're called complement proteins, and they're found circulating in your blood. And these complement proteins just circulate in your blood in an inactive form, but when they bind to an antibody that's bound to a foreign cell, it activates them and they caught, poke holes into that foreign cell. So they cause the cell to burst apart, to break apart and kill it. Okay. So those are what antibodies do. Antibodies bind foreign substances and immobilize them, get rid of them, make them make them disappear. So this is the basic um, premise behind vaccination. So why do we get vaccinated? And this is where we have that adaptive immune system where it has what we call a primary immune response, it's slow um, and it's needing to learn, and then a secondary response. So in your primary immune response, your B cells are activated and they undergo what's called clonal expansion. They make more B cells. And many of those B cells become plasma cells and some of the population of them become memory cells. And then with B cells start to produce those antibodies. So this is, this is what we're looking at at a primary immune response. So if we look at this graph in the right-hand corner of your slides here, we're looking at on the x-axis, we're looking at time in weeks. And on the y-axis, we're looking at how many antibodies are found in our blood, the concentration of antibodies in our blood. So at day zero, we have a first exposure to a foreign substance that we've never seen before. And it escapes our innate immune system. It gets past our barrier, it escapes the innate immune system. So now we're calling in the special forces. Well, it takes a while to mobilize the special forces. It takes about a week to immobilize them. And now they have to make more of themselves and they have to start to produce those antibodies. So your antibody concentration does go up, but it take, it peaks at about week two. And then the antibody concentration will, will slowly go down because they're binding to the foreign substance and they're getting rid of it. But this is a pr process. If you first get exposed to something you've never been exposed to before, it takes about three weeks for you to run the court. You get sick during this time, but your immune system is being activated and eventually you'll feel better because your immune system has finally done the job and gotten rid of the pathogen that's making you sick. But that's called the primary immune response. This, but now we've generated memory cells. Now we've made a lot more of these cells and they're hanging out at the point of entry. So now we have what's called a secondary response. Second antigen exposure, again, we're looking at time and weeks on the x-axis, and we're looking at antibody concentration on the y-axis. Now on second exposure, boom, within hours, you've activated those cells, and we are making a ton of antibodies, and not a lot, a lot, a lot, a really high titer of a high concentration. And so now those antibodies are binding to that foreign thing and immobilizing it. So it can't make you sick. So you don't might not even know that you were exposed. You don't get sick. So this is the secondary immune response. That's where your adaptive immune system has to, uh, it remembers and it's very precise. Slow remembers, has a memory and um, responds. Lane. So, um, my understanding from the time I was when I was uh, working right after college at Harvard, I was working in a in a lab where there was a medical doctor who explained to me why I kept getting the same cold over and over and over again as a balance between antigen attack, antibody response, antigen goes down, but not all the way. Antibodies go down too. antigen creeps antibodies rise, we go down and we go up. And he, when, when he explained that to me, I stopped fretting about my sick, psych, cyclical sickness. So that's one thing I'd like to confirm that that thinking is correct. Yeah, so um, when we get sick with a bacterium, we can also take externally antibiotics, not to be confused with antibodies. So antibiotics 
are something that inhibits this life cycle of a bacterium. So it can't replicate. Why they say you have to take the whole course, the whole two weeks of the, of the antibiotics um, is because in the first, you know, the first week you wipe out 90% of the bacterium in your body. And then it takes that second week to wipe out the, the next batch of bacteria in your body. Bacteria are, have certain resistance. Some are more hardy than others. So you wipe out in the first week, you wipe out all the easy ones, and then you start feeling better and you miss a couple of doses of your antibiotics. Those resistant ones, they've changed a little bit. They've evolved and they're going to say, huh, we don't, we're not responding to that antibiotic. And now they take over and grow up and they become more resistant to the antibiotic. So the, and they're different, they look different. So your special forces from before the clone ones, they don't work on them anymore. Now I have to generate clone two to work on them. So then they get into that cycle again. I see. Yeah. yeah, you're selecting for resistant ones. And so that, that, and that's why we get sick with colds all the time. The cold um, changes, the virus changes so rapidly and it, it looks different. It's no longer a triangle. It's a square net. Yeah. And the other half of the question is that my understanding is that the feeling of being sick, like having the flu that you might get from a shot, from a inoculation, is about your immune system creating the reaction that puts you down, that sinks you out, that makes you not move so you can heal. It's not the bugs that are making you feel sick, it's your reaction of your body. Is that true? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. The, all those cardinal pain, inflammation, redness, swelling, um, that just says your immune system is activated and that's what's creating the symptoms. The excessive mucus secretion, your body says, whoa, that thing came in our respiratory tract. We didn't, we must not have produced enough mucus. We better produce a lot more to trap it. The job of mucus is to trap it. So when you get a cold and your runny nose, they're just trying to, it's your own immune system that is creating the symptoms. Yeah, yeah. This primary secondary response is the whole basis of vaccination. So why we get vaccinated. Um, the reason we get vaccinated is so we can generate those memory cells so that when we're exposed to that foreign antigen, our immune system can respond really rapidly. And we're getting vaccinated with a pathogen that can't make, be, cause you to become sick. You still have an immune response, but you the pathogen can't replicate inside of your body to make you continue to make you sick. Okay. There are different types of vaccines. So we have what are called live attenuated pathogens in our vaccines. That means the pathogen can replicate, but it doesn't cause disease. So it's just replicating. It's not causing a, a real, it's not secreting toxins that can kill your cells. But that other thing too, is these pathogens can secrete toxins that kill your cells or the viruses can kill their cells in and of themselves. Okay. Or alternatively, you can use a pathogen that has been inactivated. It can't replicate or cause disease. Um, newer types of vaccines just use pieces or subunits of the pathogens. And then we also, the latest vaccine that we got for the COVID vaccine was it used not this protein subunit, but the messenger RNA that codes for the subunit and the messenger RNA instructs your body to produce the subunit of the pathogen. And then the, um, and then your immune system can respond. The, the reason why we went with the messenger RNA um, vaccines is because we can manipulate the messenger RNA, tweak it so that it can combat evolution. Um, so we're seeing rapid evolution with the COVID, the virus, it's evolving, but now I can really quickly tweak a messenger RNA and give it to you as a, as a booster shot uh, and try to combat that pathogen. So that's the quick and dirty of your immune system. So we have barriers that prevent the entry of the pathogens. And then if they do penetrate into our body, we, our innate immune system comes into play. And that involves those cells called phagocytes. 
and also cytokine secreting cells. Their job is to ingest any of the pathogens or the toxins. They trigger that pain, the redness, the inflammation. They recruit more white blood cells to the area. They recruit more um, healing molecules to come to the area so you can get uh, regeneration and repair. If the pathogen, the toxin escapes from the site of infection and moves back into your body, then you call on the adaptive immune system. And that involves those P and T lymphocytes and also antibodies. The B cells are produced the antibodies. The T cells activate your immune system. The T cells also look for cells that have viruses inside them and cells that are cancerous. And then with your adaptive immunity, you generate those memory cells because they, they recognize, remember, and respond rapidly upon secondary exposure. Okay, so with that said, what are some, um, how does your immune system respond to particular foreign agents? Um, so the first one is what if something gets inside your blood? It's in your bloodstream, they're not inside your cells, but it's moving around inside your blood. So these are bloodborne pathogens. They're either parasites, they're bacteria, they're viruses, they can be fungi, they can be toxins. So anything in your blood, not hiding out inside of a cell. Well, that's where you rely on those phagocytes. So here is a phagocyte and it's eating that foreign object. And when it does that, it goes and tells the T helper cell and says, look, look what I found. I like to think of the phagocytes as your kid coming to you. Look, mom, I found a worm. <laughs> Run to the T helper cell. The T helper cell is like the mom and says, okay, yeah, I see we have the worms. And so the T helper cells tells the B cells to produce um, antibodies that specifically bind the worm. They're very specific. And the antibodies, again, what do antibodies do? They mark that pathogen for destruction. They can also activate the complement system um, to poke holes into the pathogen. What happens if these pathogens get inside of your cells? Well, you can have virally infected cells, for example, or even your own cells that have become cancerous. Remember I said cancer cells look different than normal cells. And so they look different and your body doesn't recognize them. So that's again, a flag for your immune system. Anything that looks different than what should be there is a flag to your immune system. Virally infected cells, a cell that is virally infected actually puts out a little flag on its surface and says, help, help, I'm, I'm virally infected. Um, so that's recognized by these T cytotoxic cells. So the T cytotoxic cells are also called CD8 positive cells. They cruise around inside your body and they just start looking at your cells. Are you, do you have a flag out there telling me that you're infected? Do you look normal? If you look abnormal because you're infected, you have a virus inside of you, or because you are cancerous, that T cytotoxic cell binds to it. And cytotoxic, cyto means cell, toxic. Basically when it binds, and there's some checks and balances here involving certain proteins, but basically that triggers that C T cytotoxic cells to secrete these chemicals. One's called a perforin, one others are called granzymes. The perforins form a pore, the granzymes are enzymes that go inside of the cell and basically cause the cell to die from the inside out. So that's how your body's immune system works as it cruises around looking for things that are foreign inside the cell. So blood, blood things in the blood versus things inside of cells. So our immune system is a really powerful um, system in our body, but sometimes things can go wrong. And so this is some pathologies that you can experience when your immune system is not functioning like it should. Um, this is just the short list, but you can have what are called incorrect responses where the body attacks the self. And that's what we call autoimmune diseases. And I have an, examples of lots of different types of autoimmune diseases on the next slide. But in autoimmune diseases, you have antibodies that are binding to cells, your own cells. It's the circles are now binding to you and they shouldn't be. So that's an auto self immune, autoimmune um, pathology. 
You can also have overreactive responses, and this is what we call allergies. So in the uh, springtime, a lot of people are have allergies, and it's just basically a hypersensitivity to pollens, based, uh, pollens or dander, um, and we call those things allergens, and they cause excessive inflammatory chemical releases. So they're just triggering your immune system out of proportion to what it should do, and you're getting massive inflammation. Those inflammatory chemicals, one of them are, some of them are called histamines. So you know if you have uh, allergies, sometimes you take antihistamine, Benadryl is an antihistamine. So it's just binding to that cytokine, the histamine, and blocking it from causing inflammation and increasing mucus production, et cetera. Another pathology that we can get with our immune system is that it can be unresponsive. So it's failing to mount immune response. And so you say you have an immunodeficiency. And this can be due to genetic mutations and key regulatory genes of the immune system. Um, it could be because there is a virus, in this case, the human immunodeficiency virus has invaded those T helper cells and it kills the T helper cells. So now you don't have enough T helper cells to alert, to turn on the B cells, to turn on the T cytotoxic cells. So you get what's called an acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. So now your adaptive immune system is just not working. Your innate immune system can still work, but your adaptive immune system can't. And that's why you see weird cancers uh, in patients who have AIDS. So they're they don't have the immune surveillance going on or they get really sick with viral infections, other viruses. And then interestingly, certain pathogens have learned how to evade your immune system. They've learned how to stop your immune system from functioning the way it should. And I have an example of Lyme disease with that one. So I do wanna talk just a little bit about autoimmune diseases and then we'll talk a little bit about um, Lyme disease. So there are many types of autoimmune diseases in humans. So Graves disease or hyperthyroidism. This is an interesting disease where you have antibodies that might mimic uh, a hormone that's called thyroid stimulating hormone, which causes an overgrowth of your thyroid and an increased number of thyroid hormones being secreted. Um, Insulin dependent or type one diabetes mellitus is where you have an auto antibodies that are destroying your pancreas, certain cells in your pancreas that are called the beta cells that are producing insulin. So they are need to take insulin from the outside of the body. So again, they're making these antibodies that are attacking self. Multiple sclerosis is another one. You've talked about that. Zane has talked about that, where you have auto antibodies that are destroying the sheath that the insulating sheath around the nerves, the myelin sheath. Um, lupus is another very common one, rheumatoid arthritis, um, myasthenia gravis. Again, all these are autoantibodies to a certain protein or a certain cell type in your body. And they either destroy that cell type or they trigger inflammation like with lupus here. So those are some autoimmune diseases. Are there any questions for me about those? Just a okay. point to add, the Guillain-Barre, that's a vi vi because of a virus that the antibodies kick in and destroy the myelin sheath, or is that auto Guillain-Barre? Yeah, with all of these autoimmune diseases, and so what they what they've um, with all of these autoimmune diseases they think that what happens is that you get an outside infection and that whatever that pathogen is and because of your particular genetics. So maybe that pathogen was a circle, but you have circles on the surface of your whatever cell of your um, myelin, let's say. Your body turns on the circle clones that should have been eliminated. So the B cells that make circles, we should never make circles. So the pathogen 
Okay, so, sorry, this is, let me try that. Let me start this over. So what happens, what we think happens in almost all of these autoimmune diseases is that you get infected with something. And that something that you get infected with looks very, very close to your cells on your surface. So maybe you get infected with a circle, but you have on your surface ovals. So you activate the B cells that produce antibodies to circles and they're looking for circles. And every once in a while they see ovals and they say, oh, here's a circle, but it's not a circle, it's an oval. And so they bind to this oval and then they cause the destruction of the oval, which is your self cells. With multiple sclerosis, they now have thought, think that it's an Epstein-Barr virus that um, is the trigger. So they're trying to find what is the trigger to all of these. And so with the, I just read a paper, I think it was this year or last year, it, they're thinking it's an Epstein-Barr virus for multiple sclerosis. Did that answer your questions, Anne? Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Lane? Yeah, in terms of AIDS and HIV, is and it's destroying a component of the immune system response. So that's what the virus does. It's like it it specifically tackles your immune system. Yeah, it specifically invades. So all viruses bind to um, a certain a certain protein on the surface of a cell. So viruses are very specific for the cells that they infect. So COVID is really specific for your lung cells. And um, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, is very specific to bind to help T helper cells. Wow. So when a virus gets inside a cell, it turns that cell into a little virus making factory and it produces more of those viruses and destroys that cell in the process. If you destroy the T helper cells, the phagocytes are trying to present to T helper cells, but they can't, they can't go to mom and mom can't activate B cells to turn them on. So we've completely destroyed the T helper cells that are gonna turn on your adaptive immune system. Yeah. yeah. Great, thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Other um, questions for cl or clarifications? Yeah, um, Barbara. Um, so I have vitiligo. Um, which responses does that one fit into? What 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 do you have? Ligo. Vitiligo. Um, oh yes. So I it's it's thought to be an autoimmune disease where your body is attacking. Uh, well, you're getting destruction of the cells, the melanin producing cells. Right, that's where you have the decreased pigmentation. Is mm -hmm. that what that is? Okay, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah, so we think it is because, so in your skin, you have epidermal cells, you have hair fol follicle cells, and then you have these melanocytes and the melanocytes are producing the pigment that creates the colors. And so they just think in certain areas you're getting, the melanocytes are dying and it might be an autoimmune disease because you have an auto antibodies binding specifically to the melanocytes, killing them. And so they're not producing the pigment, the melanin pigment. Okay. And um, my mother had rheumatoid arthritis. So would that make sense that some kind of, even though I don't have rheumatoid that got passed down? Yeah, I didn't go into this. Um, it's beyond the scope. It's because it can get kind of complicated, but you need a certain genetic propensity so um, in order to get an autoimmune disease. So certain, so when I gave you the example of the myelin sheath, you got infected with a circle and you made ovals, not everybody makes ovals. It's only your genetics that allows you to make ovals. I might've made squares. And so if I got infected with a circle, it would never, I would not get that autoimmune disease. But if I have a genetic to say make ovals and I get infected with a circle, there might be some cross reactivity and then I would be more prone to getting an autoimmune disease. So it has to do with these surface markers on the surface of your cell, they're called MHC markers. Um, and, and that's derived from your genetics. So you might have inherited a genetic predisposition to making a certain shape that is very close to something in nature, mimic something in nature. 
Okay. And um, both of our, um, well, when, when it came up for my mom and myself was after a, an extreme stressful event, not, not an infection or anything, but just a stressful event. Is that, does that sound right? Um, yeah. And that I, we, um, it was mentioned another time where you kind of go into when you have a stressful event, your immune system gets tamped down because your body says, I can't, I'm, I'm in high stress. Now I have to mobilize resources. I can't quite deal with the immune system right now. I got to deal with other things. So your immune system is tamped down a little bit, which allows any kind of, um, pathogen to kind of have a bloom there. Um, and so then it gets a toe hold and then you can have, you know, a relapse and then you can go back into remission. So it just kind of ramps it up a little bit where you can go through, get out of remission and get into a relapse area. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and any of these, so any of these auto antibodies, when antibodies deposit, when they, when they're out there and they're binding to these foreign things or binding to your own cells, it always triggers that inflammatory response. It always causes an inflammatory response. That's just part of it. And so in, in addition to destroying self cells or self things, collagen, self proteins, it's also triggering inflammation, which is what the rheumatoid arthritis is decide besides destroying collagen, it's creating so much inflammation and pain that they don't want to move the joints. And then the joints kind of get out of whack a little bit because they're so painful. Yeah. So it's a sad, it's a, it's a pretty common actually rheumatoid arthritis, but it's also really um, debilitating. Yeah. Barb, um, could I ask a question? It was thinking sure, about just... a stressful event. Um, what about chronic stress? Um, how does that affect the immune system? Yeah, chronic stress. Um, so you have excessive amount of corticosterone, the corticosteroids, the cortisone in your body. And that's just um, so that cortisone is trying to tamp down inflammation. I can't deal with inflammation right now because I'm in a stressful situation. I gotta, I gotta not be inflamed. But what it does do is it then, but kind of overrides that inflammatory response. So high levels, <laughs> it's kind of a complicated arm of it. High levels of chronic stress causes high levels of corticosteroids, which causes deposition of fat in your truncal areas. So um, it's like, I got to protect these internal organs. I'm going to mobilize fats from my extremities and move it to my internal organs. I'm going to put a layer of fat around my internal organs. I got to protect them. It also, because of that excessive deposition of fat, even though your immune system is kind of tamped down, it creates an inflammatory response. So then you get inflammation alongside of it and you get excessive fluid. And you see that with the children who are cancer patients that are children, they give them a lot of corticosteroids to try to damp down the pain, reduce pain, because that's another thing it does. But they also get that moon face, they get swollen in their face. Um, and that's part of just taking steroids. If you were to take steroids too, you'd have more fat around your middle. Um, you'll see this in a lot of your uh, clients that come in deposition of Men are more prone to deposition of fat in their middle and that in their gut area, but high levels of stress and also a bad diet, but high levels of stress will create excessive deposition around, around the truncal region. Did I, I just walked around that question. Did I answer it specifically enough, Chris? Yeah, no, I was, I was just curious about what the immune response was. Um, and I think this, the next question is, is, as if you can take yourself out of that chronic stress, does that allow things to reverse and to reduce the fat around the organs and things like that? And yes, yes. And it also reverses the other thing I didn't say is with excess 
cortisol secretion, your body mobilizes sugars and puts lots of sugar in your blood because your body's like, we're in a stressful situation. I need to mobilize sugar so that I can have good energy for my muscle cells, but that create, but you're not moving, you know, you're not using it. So it creates hyperglycemia. So it puts you on the pathway of type two diabetes. And so, yes, if you catch it early enough, you can back it, back it out and, and recover. Um, they saw that they saw the type two diabetes and a lot of um, the Vietnam vets came in because they were under chronic stress. They were very thin. And it's like, well, these guys are very thin. Why are they getting type two diabetes? Oh, they have high levels of cortisol. They have PTSD. Their, their cortisol levels are ramped up, which is causing them to mobilize sugars into their bloodstream, which is causing hyperglycemia and all the complications with that. So yeah, you can get type two diabetes without being obese or, or um, overweight. Yeah, but absolutely. And you know that too, you know, you, you're, you tell your clients, Hey, if you can lose weight, if you can reduce your stress, we can ramp it back down. We can bring you back down to your basal level and um, reduce some of these symptoms. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, the last little side, oh, there's, um, I'll go through these quick, we're running out of time, but um, Lyme disease can also cause neuropathy. So neuropathy is damage to your nerve cells. Um, Lyme disease is actually caused by a bacterium. It enters into your body through a tick bite. And if it's untreated, and it's, it's if you suspect that you've gotten bit by a, a tick that harbors the Lyme disease bacterium, one of the common symptoms is a bullseye rash, but you should go get antibiotics. If you get it right away, you're good to go. But if it's untreated, that infection can spread to your joints, the heart, and the nervous system. Um, research from UC Davis in 2015 suggests that the bacteria evades your immune system. So it subverts the immune system and stops the production of B memory and B plasma cells. So it's, so I, one of the pathologies, I said, these pathogens can trick your back, your uh, immune system. And this is how it's tricking your immune system. And so your innate system continues to respond because it sees this pathogen there, but your adaptive immune system never gets activated because it's just, it's evading it. And you can continue to get that inflammatory response that can continue to create damage to your joints, your heart and the peripheral nervous system. Lane. So is that why um, the people that I've known who've been uh, cured of Lyme disease have a course of antibiotics, uh, maybe a couple of three different kinds that goes on for a very long time. And is that because of the infiltration into the joints and the heart and to other organ systems that are harder to reach period like that? Yeah. Yeah. Once they're in the joints, um, the blood supply there is, is low. Um, and so it's a little bit harder to combat. So yeah, we're just really trying to tamp down that bacterium to such a level, um, and, and reduce your inflammation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, shingles, I talked about this a little bit. So the virus that causes chicken pox, it can go into enter into your nervous system and, and it remains quiescent. Um, at a later time, that virus can become uh, active when your immune system is, maybe when you're stressed, your immune system is ramped down a little bit. And so it can cause the symptoms of shingles, which are pain, rats, itching, and in some individuals, neuralgia and facial paralysis. So that's shingles. Um, inflammation, uh, myositis is inflammation of the muscles that can be caused by a viral infection or an autoimmune disease. So um, that also can cause neuropathy. Um, this, this last, uh, so COVID can also invade, evade our immune system. So the virus that causes COVID is called the SARS-CoV-2. It invades cells of your lungs. So it binds to a particular receptor on your lung cells to gain entry. 
it transforms those lung cells into little virus-making factories. The invaded lung cells release a protein a cytokine called interferon, and the interferons protect neighboring cells. Say, hey, I'm infected, watch out, there's a, there's a prowler on the loose. So the interferons block the virus from leaving an infected cell, and the interferons recruit those T and D cells. But the virus has many proteins that can disrupt this process. Um, it has proteins that disrupt a cell's ability to detect an infection, proteins that reduce the synthesis of those interferons, plus many other subversive tactics. So they think perhaps patients who have long COVID, maybe that virus has hijacked their immune system and not allowed the immune system to function as, as readily as it should. Um, a little bit uh, aside here, but kind of connected to the immune system. And this is the trifecta of sugar, your gut bacterium, so your microbiome and your immune system. So they're working together. And so the background for this, this is my last slide, is that they, they, they are, scientists are really concerned about the obesity epidemic. So they're doing a lot of studies on it. So they feed mice a high fat, high sugar diet, and those mice become obese. But if they remove the sugar from the high fat diet, the mice are no longer obese. So it's not necessarily the fat, but it's the sugar but it's more complicated than that. So there's a recent article in 2022 in a journal called Cell, and they found that if they give the mice a high sugar, high fat diet, that high sugar diet cause a certain type of intestinal bacteria that to go away. It eliminated those intestinal bacteria. But these intestinal bacteria, part of your microbiome, are the good guys because what they were doing were they were activating T helper cells. Weird bacteria activating our own immune system. And these T helper cells, weirdly enough, were telling your body to reduce fat uptake. Don't uptake all this fat. We don't need it. So high sugar killing these intestinal bacteria who were activating T helper cells that said, don't take up fat. So without these T help, without the intestinal bacteria, without the T helper cells, now the mice were up taking more fat than they normally would. And they're becoming obese. Pretty wild, huh? <laughs> so that that's, that's the immune system for you. Any questions? Um, yeah, I was wondering with HIV and I guess COVID as well, these um, viruses that turn off aspects of the immune system, do the, is the technology with the messenger, uh, the mRNA, um, is that a potential for turning back on parts of the immune system that get turned off by different viruses? Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's part of it. Another thing that they're trying to do is like remove certain of your immune system cells and microengineering them to be more specific for the pathogen. So training them and they're doing that is called CAR T therapy. They're doing that, especially for cancer. So certain cancers are evading the immune system. So they're taking your immune system cells out and say, Hey, here's what the cancer is and training them outside the body and say, come on, look for this. This is what you're supposed to be looking for. And then reintroducing them back into the body. That's where we're at. But where you said is, can we turn back on those T help those immune cells, that's another area where um, that CRISPR technology might be of, of use. Yeah, absolutely. Barb, can you touch a um, second on polio um, and how that, so I know it's a small percentage that end up with the respiratory failure or the nervous attacking the nervous system in the end, but so that's a viral virus that comes in um, that the body gets beat by, I guess, in one way or another. And then do you know what the process is there? Yeah, it's it's kind of the, the same thing um, where the virus gets inside of your body, your immune system mounts a response, 
um, and tries to combat it, but it can invade into your nervous system and cause, you know, certain paralysis. So, so it can remain in there. Um, so it's, so where it has, what part of your immune system, most of the time it's of the lower limbs. So you'll see polio patients not being very mobile, but sometimes it can invade into the, um, lungs. And then that's where they have to be put on the iron lung, um, have the respiratory. So it's, it's, it's the virus. It's kind of like the shingles or the uh, Lyme disease bacterium, where it's destroying nerve nerves tissue and causing the symptoms in that way. Again, it's evading the immune system in, in that way. Um, I mean, I think one of the biggest breakthroughs uh, for vaccinations was polio. Um, I, I think in our grandparents' generation, there were a lot of people with polio, but in our generation, we don't see it because we've had the vaccine, but it was a, it's a pretty debilitating disease. Yeah, it's, it's, again, it's the virus has escaped your immune system. And then when people die of the flu, for example, is that because their body can no longer re respond? Is their immune system no longer strong enough to respond in a way that would beat that virus versus somebody else who gets the same virus has a stronger, is it about the strength of the immune system or is it more viral load or is it? Yes, yes, yes. So it's, okay. it's multifaceted. So absolutely how healthy you were to begin with. Um, and part of that plays into your diet and your stress levels. Um, the viral load that you got, um, your genes and your genetics, how rig how vigorous a response you're going to get. So, oh yeah, absolutely. So the two populations that are most um, vulnerable to the flu are the very young and the very old. The very young is because they haven't, um, their adaptive immune system hasn't been trained yet. We haven't, you know, it, it needs to learn. The very old, um, as we get old, as we age, our immune system tamps down. So our thymus actually goes away. So we aren't making more T helper cells and T cytotoxic cells as much as we were before. We So our immune system declines as we get older. So that's where it's very dangerous. Patients who've died, for example, of COVID, they're that interferon that I said earlier, oops, let's see, go back. Um, this interferon, it's just a cytokine. They have what they call an interferon storm. They release so much interferon, it causes so much inflammation. It ramps up their immune system so much that they create so much inflammation that that's what they're dying from is an excessive, it's like an allergic response and they're dying from excessive um, mucus production secretions, they're kind of drowning in their own fluids with the COVID. So yeah, th that's with the flu. So, and, and you're getting so much damage of your lung cells and like with the flu, the flu is damaging your respiratory tract, um, those cells of the respiratory tract. So it's compromising your, the respiratory system. Okay, one last I'll throw. <laughs> I think you sort of answered this already, but when we talked about the length of an illness or the length of a virus to mount that antibody response, I'm assuming that that is the amount of time it just takes your body to build up enough of the special forces to, yeah. to, to fight, to combat it. And based on load and strength of your immune system is how long it will take you to get over something. Yes, absolutely. And for most people, um, a course of a, you know, I got a cold and it lingers for about three weeks. Okay. So for most standard. people, yeah, on average, it's about three weeks. If, uh, But if, again, if you have um, a compromised immune system in any way, for whatever reason, um, it could be longer. Yeah. And if, and if you go in, you know, you go in and and you don't feel good and you take a, a round of antibiotics, but you don't finish the brown. Now you've selected for those superbugs, and now you're going to create a super infection that's 
that your body has to again mount another immune response to, and it may be not resist, it may be not responsive to um, drugs from the outside world. Most of the drugs that we take when we're sick are just trying to help your own immune system do a better job. And sometimes those drugs are saying, whoa, tamp it down. Don't, don't, don't work so hard. You're producing so much histamine, you're creating even more damage, or you're causing so much more inflammation, you're, you're creating more damage. So some of the drugs are tamping down your immune system. Some of the drugs are activating your immune system. And some of the drugs are specifically targeted to the pathogen, antibiotics for bacteria, antivirals for viruses. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I was, well, I was telling Lane, I was just so impressed with you ladies. Um, just so curious. And I love that um, you have this desire to learn. It's just so, it's so awesome. <laughs>